Now, I'd like you to take a look at page 69, and we're going to take a look at the readings. These readings are somewhat obscure, but extremely profound in what they reveal to us about the Lord's passion. So the first reading is from Isaiah 50, which precedes Isaiah 53, which is probably the most direct prophecy and clearly understandable um, uh, prophecy for the gospel, which it talks about him suffering for our sins. Now this prophecy in Isaiah 50, keep in mind written centuries before Jesus arrives, talks to us about his passion in a very profound way. So at first it talks about his preaching ministry. The Lord God has given me a well-trained tongue that I might know how to speak to the weary, a word that will rouse them. So Jesus, of course, speaking to the poor and, and many of the people that were sick and, and possessed and, and ill, and he, and he would rouse them by healing them. Morning after morning, he opens my ear that I might hear. I have not rebelled, I have not turned back. So Jesus here, uh, the prophecy of course is, the, is sort of in the person of Christ speaking. He has not turned back from the suffering that he must face. As he said in the agony of garden, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not my will but thine be done. He has not turned back. So then we see the second sorrowful mystery of the rosary revealed I gave my back to those who beat me so um, this is the second sorrowful mystery and then the next one the third sorrowful mystery the crowning of thorns and the mocking and it goes on to say I gave my back to those who beat me my cheeks to those who plucked my beard my face I did not shield from the buffets and the spitting the Lord God is my help therefore I am not disgraced I have set my face like flint knowing that I shall not be put to shame. So, if you've seen Mel Gibson's movie, The Passion, and remember that Jesus is there and he's being scourged, and at some point I think he falls over from it so bad, but he gets right back up and holds onto the pillar, and the soldiers are amazed at his willingness to suffer because he is the Lamb of God. And so he sets his face like flint, like uh, with, with great determination and strength with the hardness of, of a rock like flint. And so he's ready to continue to be beaten for our sins. So keep in mind that this is God. And so, you know, things happen to us now and then that get us annoyed. Yesterday, some bozo hit my car with a carriage in the parking lot and uh, put a dent in my, my car. I mean, it's new to me. It's eight years old, but it's still new to me. Anyway, I've only had it for a year. And I was saying to myself, it's probably a good thing I wasn't here when they did it because I would probably be in trouble with the police. And I realized that, you know, it's just anger coming out. And, you know, the thing is that the anger that we have is often a measure of our pride. The shorter fuse we have to anger and the greater the anger, the greater the pride. But we are not called to pride. Pride is a natural inclination because of sin. It's easy for us to be proud, easy for us to be angry, hard for us to be humble, hard for us to be meek as Jesus was on the cross. So when we consider that God himself, who could have struck back immediately and easily overpowered all of those men, all those soldiers who were beating him and scourging him and smacking him in the face and spitting in his face and, and mocking him and making jokes, when you consider that he could have easily struck back at any time and he did not do it. That is a profound example for all of us of humility and meekness and patience. Meek does not mean weak. It means patience and suffering without responding in anger. And God, our Lord Jesus Christ, could have easily struck back and he did not. Next we see Psalm 22, which is a beautiful psalm about the passion. And it's interesting that it precedes Psalm 23, the famous one that everyone knows, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, etc. That has a little beautiful imagery. To me, Psalm 23 is more like the Easter psalm, the resurrection psalm, whereas Psalm 22 is the Good Friday psalm. In fact, Jesus basically praised this from the cross because 
He says those words, uh, they're one of the seven last words. The first line of Psalm 22, My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? And this shows us how profoundly Jesus has become human. Remember, he's both fully God and fully man. And Jesus feels the emotions we do. It says that uh, one of the shortest sentences in the Bible, when Lazarus died, it says, Jesus wept. And in the agony in the garden, his emotions coming forth, he's asking to get a, find a way out of the passion, out of the cross. Jesus wants to get away from the cross. Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not my will but thine be done. And that's a prayer for us to say in times of temptation and suffering, to strengthen us, to look at what Jesus went through. Not an easy thing to do. And so he says this first line of the psalm, but the implication is the entire psalm. That's the implication while he's up there. And so what do we see being said? We see this prophecy centuries ago, and it's, it's unfolding and being fulfilled right there. As Jesus is on the cross, the Pharisees are down there, and it's a prophecy for the Pharisees, what they're going to do and say. All who see me scoff at me. They mock me with parted lips. They wag their heads. He relied on the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him if he loves him. So the words of the Pharisees is really the words of the worldly perspective. Let him come down from the cross and we will believe. That is the condition of the world's belief. Why does the world not believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ? Because it involves the cross and sacrificial love. The world does not want the message of denying yourself daily, taking the cross and following him. The world wants indulge yourself daily. Reject the cross. And so, let him come down from the cross and then we will believe. But does he come down? No. Jesus stays on the cross until 3 o'clock, the hour of mercy. That's why we have divine mercy, the prayer for the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us and on the whole world. The 3 o'clock hour of prayer is even mentioned in the book of the Acts of the Apostles as the hour of prayer, 3 o'clock when Jesus dies on the cross. So this beautiful Psalm 22 goes on, Indeed, many dogs surround me. A pack of evildoers closes in upon me. So the soldiers crucifying him, the Pharisees mocking him. Then the prophecy, again, centuries before for the crucifixion. They have pierced my hands and my feet. How clear can it be? Doesn't get much clearer than that. They've pierced my hands and my feet. He's crucified. I can count all my bones. And then the prophecy. The soldiers take his tunic and they don't want to tear it. And they cast lots. They divided my garments among them and from my vesture they cast lots. O Lord, be not far from me. O he my help, hasten to aid me. So we see Jesus entering into this passion very powerfully. So I hope as we read this shortly in preparation for the reading of the passion, that you're entering into the, the profound meaning that is contained here in these prophecies written centuries before for the gospel. And our second reading to the Philippians Jesus, uh, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God something to be grasped. Remember, as I said, when we are mocked and insulted, we're not God, we're sinners. We got it coming. Jesus doesn't have it coming. He has it coming to him because of our sins. He has no sin. Goes on to say, rather he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave. Coming in human likeness and human appearance, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Because of this, God greatly exalted him. Now, let's apply this to ourselves. Humbling, it says he humbled himself. Are we humbling ourselves? A difficult thing to do. We can only do it properly through prayer. A life of daily prayer is the only way we can truly be humble in life. Humble enough to be obedient. It says he humbled himself becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. We are called to humble ourselves becoming obedient to the Ten Commandments, the 14 works of mercy, to the point of death, to persevere until the day we die. Even death on the cross, meaning the cross of self-denial. The cross of resisting temptation to sins against the Ten Commandments. The cross of remembering to be charitable to our neighbor through the works of mercy. 
And then, as it says of Jesus, it will say this of us, because of this God greatly exalted him. And so too, we will be exalted by the Lord God if we humble ourselves obediently to the point of death, carrying our cross, keeping the commandments, the works of mercy, receiving the sacraments, and leading a life of prayer. It is then, at the end of our lives, that the cross will end and God will exalt us. The problem with us is our perspective on time. We are in time, and this world that we are in now seems, emotionally, almost like it's eternal. But the reality is, when we get into eternity, this world will become almost as if it never was. Think about it. Let's say we live 120 years. That would be too mobile for the last 30. Between 90 and 120, you don't get around too much. You can't sing the Beach Boys song, I Get Around, but you, you, you got your walker, I guess. So let's say you live 120. What does that compare to eternity? Just imagine mathematically on a graph. You put 120 years, and then you put a billion years, and a billion, billion years, and then a billion, billion, et cetera, et cetera. It becomes as if it never was. And that's why eternity is a concept that's hard to grasp, but very important for us to remember. Because we get so caught up with this world, we forget about the next. We forget about the need for prayer to prepare ourselves to enter into the kingdom of heaven here and now. The need to be humble and obedient, carrying that cross, the commandments, the works of mercy, the life of prayer. That's what we are called to do, that we may become one with him on the cross and then one with him at the resurrection.